Thomas, and we're going to do only the first verse. We gather in the presence of God's Spirit. The Spirit is life and peace. The Spirit offers, offers promise to each new day. The Spirit brings hope out of despair. And even in death, through God's Spirit, we discover life. God's Spirit dwells within us. We gather to worship in the presence of God's Spirit. Thanks be to God. And our opening hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 264.
Gracious God, who creates, sustains, and redeems all life, we come seeking your disturbing presence and comforting peace. We praise you for the joy of being your people. May your spirit be with us and move within us in this time of worship. Give us hearts that hear your word and minds that are open to the transforming power of your love. Amen. Okay, today's question for the young at heart is how does a glass of water remind you of God? A glass of water. And uh, when I think of it, I think of the fact that humans need water to survive. We cannot survive without water. And I believe that we cannot survive without God either. And so uh, that's the biggest reminder I have. Um, and you can have the, the more uh, the, the other ones that things like Jesus is is the, uh, the water of life and, and we use water for baptism and all sorts of all sorts of uh, times when water is referred to um, in the Bible. But the main thing for me is that we cannot live without God as we cannot live without water. All that talk about a glass of water and then feeling hot and it's like, oh goodness. Um, our next hymn then is uh, number 665, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior.
all men. In our reading from the Old Testament, or the Hebrew text, if you would, it's from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15, and chapter 21, verses 1 to 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in, favor in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sets of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah? they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the Gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, to chapter 10, verse 8. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve,
Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. May God grant to our understanding those readings from our Holy Scripture. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in God's sight. I, um, I've been writing a brief message for the mail-out um, services that we do, uh, so people get some sort of message. And um, have been continuing to do the Sunday tape message the way the way I'm used to doing it and you're used to having me do it. But this week's scripture uh, really struck me. And um, so I would actually like to read it to you what I what I sent out um, instead of instead of my normal way. So uh, it's just the way it is. God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, and yet his wife Sarah had failed to conceive. They had an Egyptian slave girl named Hagar, whom Sarah convinced Abraham to impregnate. That son was called Ishmael. Then, in today's story, Sarah finally conceives, and she too has a son. It is from his son Isaac that the generations leading to Jesus descended. The Muslim belief is that it is from Ishmael that the prophet Muhammad descended. The primary message that we are supposed to get from this reading from Genesis is that God keeps God's promises. Be patient. But I would like to talk about the stories before and after the stranger's visits to Abraham and Sarah. Here we find stories of injustices ingrained in the culture of the day. It was 14 years earlier, in Genesis 15, that we are told about the birth of Ishmael. Hagar was a slave. Her mistress, Sarah, gave her to her 85-year-old husband, Abraham, to impregnate. Hagar had no say in that. Slavery was a part of the culture. I believe that it is this kind of biblical endorsement of slavery that perpetuated the practice of slavery for thousands of years. The economic yield to the slave owners would have been substantial, as is the case with modern-day slavery. Yes, we still have modern-day slavery. It is disguised differently but it exists. From the internet I share this information. Modern slavery is a multi-billion dollar interest industry with just the forced labor aspect generating 150 billion US dollars each year. The Global Slavery Index from 2018 estimated that roughly 40.3 million individuals are currently caught in modern slavery, with 71% of those being female and one in four being children. Slavery today, you ask? Well, there's different types of slavery happening in our world today. There are courses of sex trafficking and different TV shows will, will uh, uh, highlight them, but it doesn't change anything. Um, and then there's child sex trafficking as well. There's forced labor, and there's forced child labor. There's bonded labor or debt bondage. So that is one where you owe somebody, and so you have to work it off. 
domestic servitude, and unlawful recruitment and use of child soldiers. So that's what slavery looks like today. And again, the common thing to, to Abraham's day is the fact that there is no choice. These people have no choice. And when I was in Guatemala, um, the, uh, the factories there, uh, working at, at slave wages, really, um, and they weren't allowed to unionize and they weren't allowed to, to process, protest. And the factories were actually guarded by the military um, so that people uh, would be kept oppressed and not, not be able to, um, to strike or, or anything like that to try and get uh, a more decent uh, wage, a livable wage. I believe that slavery is just one of the injustices in our world that Jesus came to change. I further believe that, the, that there exists no protection for the victims. Sorry, I missed the line. I further believe that the Holy Spirit worked through many in order for it to become illegal in the world. However, because it is illegal, there exists no protection for the victims. Um, I'm not suggesting that it be legalized, but right now, because it's so underground, where do the victims get the, uh, their protection from? And as long as consumers keep consuming the products provided by these modern-day slaves, the situation will not change. And that we can make a difference in. When we buy goods, who were they made by? Um, I remember it was a long time ago, my grandchildren were little, and uh, we were looking, I guess it was about the year 2000, we were looking at, at Nike's paid Michael Jordan more to promote their product than they paid all of their Malaysian workers together in a year. Um, and so my daughter wouldn't buy Nikes for her children. And so every year they would say, can we have Nikes yet, Grandma? So I don't think they ever got them. And I have no idea how that's doing today. Um, but we do, we need to pay attention to where things are made that we buy. And there's controversy on that too. Um, some will say, some of the workers in places like that who are, who are getting a meager uh, wage will say it's better to have some than none. Um, but I still think corporate giants um, would rather pay a larger wage and charge a larger amount for their product um, in order to continue to reap the profits than, than to have everybody boycott the products. Okay, the second story that I draw to your attention happens in chapter 19, which is one that was skipped over for today's readings. And the strangers, believed to be angels, traveled on from Abraham's tent to Sodom, to Lot's house, where they spent the night. And the area around Sodom was dangerous for strangers. It was not uncommon for them to be attacked sexually by men in the community. This life was no different. The story tells us that all the men of the city came and surrounded Lot's house and called for him to send the two strangers out. And we hear that Lot, wanting to protect these men, offered his virgin daughters to the crowd instead. It's another example of the absence of any women's rights, a condition that exists even in many cultures in our world today. Certainly not an action that Jesus would condone. I move on now to the Gospel reading. Jesus saw that there were way more people in need of his ministry than he would be able to tend to. So he empowered his disciples to share the work. We too are empowered to share in the work of Christ. I think that the incidents of mental, emotional, and spiritual illnesses is particularly high in our world today. There are so many pressures, so many violations, so few opportunities for sacred time and space. We can make a difference in the lives of those afflicted. Food, shelter, clothing, a listening ear, a prayer, a kind word, a referral, a 
smile. And hopefully sometime in the not too distant future, a hug. Never underestimate the power of the Spirit working through you. Most of the time, you will have no idea of the difference you have made in a person's day or life, but don't let that stop you. Continue to be as Christ to those you meet. Seek out the sick and burdened and share the love of Jesus with them. Christ has given you that authority just as he gave it to his disciples so long ago. And just as the disciples were instructed to give without payment, we too must offer up ourselves without payment. We have received our gifts through the grace of God, and so we must use them for his glory, not ours. Everybody can give something, and yes, some more than others. I'm reminded of the Christmas hymn, Little Drummer Boy. He had nothing to give but his gift of music. But rather than say he had nothing to give, he gave of himself. This week I invite you to be intentional about your Christian discipleship. Give at least one gift per day. I know that it is harder to do when we're isolated. So instead of a face-to-face -face smile, it may be a special effort to pick up the phone and call someone to offer a word of cheer, or maybe send a note, or maybe make an offering to the food bank, etc., etc. May God bless you in your ministry. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, too often when we give, we give with the expectation of something in return. We desire recognition, status, loyalty, gratitude, reciprocation, authority, or extra grace. Help us to give without expectation. Help us to give as you give out of love. When we find it difficult to love the planet, others, ourselves, or the church, help us to give out of love for you, trusting you with our offerings. Help us to give freely of our time. Help us to give freely and gracefully of our expertise. Help us to give freely and unbegrudgingly of our treasure. And as we do, open our hearts to love you more dearly and to see you more clearly in the world around us. Amen. And our next hymn is number 333, Love Divine, All Loves Itself.
At this time, then, we present our offering for the work of Christ in this community and throughout the world. And again, I commend those who have found uh, ways to, to get their financial support to the treasurers. Um, it takes a lot of pressure off the treasurers, I think. Anyway, thank you so much. Love 
and grace you so freely offer us and for the opportunities to share with the world around us. We are thankful for those who work to reverse the damage that we have caused to our environment and teach us how to be good stewards of this planet Earth. We are thankful for those who work to free the oppressed, to feed the hungry, to provide shelter and clean clothes for the homeless, to visit the sick and the elderly. We are thankful for the opportunities to be part of your solutions. We are thankful at this time for those who have worked tirelessly to protect us from the spread of COVID-19 as they tend to patients already infected by it. We are thankful for those things which have not changed. The lengthening and warming of days, the beauty of flowers, the shade of the trees, the growth of crops, the health of our animals. We are thankful for the technology that helps us stay in touch with others. Phones, computers, iPads and tablets, and for the postal system. We are thankful for the volunteers who make it possible for our church services to continue through this time of isolation. We are thankful for those who shop and deliver groceries to the vulnerable among us so that they are not exposed to COVID-19. We are thankful for the 95th anniversary of the United Church of Canada and our place in its continued ministry. Yes, God, there is so much to be thankful for here in this place. Yet suffering still happens. We pray for those who are ill, those who are weary, those who are unemployed, those who are experiencing financial loss, those who grieve, the farmers who have a shortage of workers. We pray for the earth as it continues to groan from abuse. We offer at this time our individual prayers of thanksgiving and concern, aloud or within the silence of our hearts.
May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. Amen.